good morning, everybody. Let's stand and sing together. Let's get ready for the Christmas season, for Christmas coming up. you this morning to turn around and greet your neighbor with the love of Christ this morning. Give a handshake or a hug. I invite you to remain standing as we join together in a in affirming our faith using the words of the Apostles Creed as our guide. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning, church. 
So good to be with all of you this morning. I want to welcome you all to Covenant. It is a gift to be able to worship the Lord on this, the fourth Sunday of Advent together. Uh, we have some cards in the seat backs in front of you. The first of those is a guest card. It says, I'm new. Uh, if you are a guest with us, I want to offer a warm word of welcome and invite you to fill out some contact information there. The Lord has called us to be about the work of building a community connecting in Christ. And in that effort, we would love to have the opportunity to connect with you and welcome you to the church. There's also a prayer card, uh, and we know that so many of us come into this space of worship today with a prayer on our hearts, and so I invite you uh, to write and record your prayer there. Either of those cards can be put in the offering plate later in worship. I have a couple of invitations for you, and the first is uh, something that is taking place tonight, this evening. Uh, we are going to have our uh, caroling caravan and, and I want you to know that some people think that today there's uh, some huge trophy that's going to be won. Um, and no, it's not the World Cup of Soccer. It is this bad boy, okay? Now, now this is uh, coming home with the victor. The crown will belong to the one that has the most wonderfully decorated car. Because here's how the caroling caravan works at 5 o'clock, we gather together in the parking lot. We decorate our cars. By the way, lights are preferred. So if you can uh, light up your car, decorate your car, we're then going to have music in the back of three different trucks along the caravan, and we're going to drive through Liberty Branch, and we're going to drive through most of Tupelo, and we're going to, sh to spread Christmas cheer. Now, you might have heard that the best way to spread Christmas cheer is for, by singing loud for all to hear. Uh, for most of you, that might not be your preferred pathway. Um, and if it's not, guess what? Uh, you will be in your car. And so you can sing loud for your family to hear. And uh, that's, that's a, a beautiful compromise. And so uh, this will be given out to the victor, the most well-decorated car. I hope that you will uh, 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 put in the opportunity, uh, take advantage of this opportunity to join together as a community, uh, spreading this Christmas cheer through the caroling caravan. Also, uh, this Christmas Eve on Saturday, uh, we have been planning to have Christmas under the stars uh, back out at Rob Fleming Park again. As many of you might have heard, we are going to have a winter tundra come through this week. Uh, it won't be the ice, supposedly, the ice and the rain as we had in 2021. However, it is going to be so cold that we have recognized that it would not be as hospitable to our community, particularly to young families and elderly and anyone else who's been raised deep in the South and doesn't believe in the cold. So, um, you know, with temperatures that were going to start at 36 and then drop down around 30 or 30, 32 or 31 during the worship service, uh, I have made the very difficult decision of moving the service from under the stars here in this space. Same time, different place. 5.30 Christmas Eve worship here in this room. I hope that you will come together uh, with your church family as a community to celebrate the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. And then the next morning, Christmas morning, 10 o'clock, come in your PJs. Uh, we'll uh, join together for a brief service of worship, an opportunity to celebrate all that God has done uh, through the gift of his son, Jesus. Uh, let's um, bow for a, a word of prayer together. Lord, we come before you thankful for the work that you're doing in our midst, and I pray, oh God, that you would make yourself known to us uh, through this time of worship. Lord, be, we, we ask that you would guide us by the power of your spirit and be present with us, moving amongst us and in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, I invite the Humphreys to come forward for our Advent wreath lighting. The scripture this morning is from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 to 12. 
Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is the love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son in atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. When we come into contact with true love, we come into contact with God, for love comes from God. In the same way, when we offer true love to others, we offer them God himself. This Advent, let us prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus by intentionally offering true love to our family, friends, and even strangers whom God places in our path, that they might know the unconditional love of the God who loves us before we even know what love is. Today we relight the candle of hope. Recalling God's promise, the candle of peace, celebrating Christ as the Prince of Peace, and the candle of joy, reminding us of the joy found in him. Now we light the candle of love. As we anticipate Christmas, let us remember our loving Savior who came once as a baby and will come again in glory. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for your gift of love shown to us perfectly in Jesus Christ the Lord. Help us prepare our hearts for his coming by loving others as he loves us. We ask this in the name of the one born in Bethlehem, Jesus, our loving Lord. Amen. Uh, in uh, recognition of God's great love, uh, I'd like to encourage everybody to stand up and let's worship him. I will sing of your goodness, I will sing of your love, though the seasons come quickly, you have always been enough, though the night may get darker, though the waiting seems long, you have always been faithful to remind me of your love, you are good. In the morning I'll sing you are good. In the evening I'll sing you are good. You are good to me. You have always been patient. You have always been kind. You're consistent through the So I'll remind my soul to bless you, standing firm upon your truth, knowing you cannot be shaken, cause I've seen what you can do.
morning we're going to sing a classic Christmas song reflecting on Jesus as a baby in a manger and as we do also singing of his greatness that even as an infant we can look upon him and see his greatness all the fullness of God in a helpless babe and we can hold those two things in a beautiful connection with one another. So before we sing, let's just steady our hearts, holding these two truths together. That Jesus came in such a vulnerable space. And he also came with power and might everything that he needed to save us. Thank you. 
will cry, these bones will sing. Their church. God, I'm so thankful that you had a plan all along. That it's a creative one and one that nobody saw coming. God, that you didn't come in the way a warrior would look, yet you were one. You didn't come in the way that a leader would look like, yet you were one. You didn't come in the way of a savior who was equipped what that would look like, yet you are fully savior, fully equipped even as a baby. God, study our hearts on what this season is truly about. And as your kids, we lift up the prayer you taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You may be seated.
at this time. The, the kids are dismissed, dismissed to head back to Cuff Kids, to dig into God's Word, to have fun together as you grow in your faith. And we're going to turn our attention uh, to God's Word uh, first in Isaiah chapter 9 and then in Ephesians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me there uh, and prepare for that transition. If not, you can follow along with the words on the screen as we together hear the word of the Lord. First, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And now we're going to turn our attention to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be reading verses 14 through 18. Again, let's hear the word of the Lord. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Father God, this morning I'm just touched by the fact that, uh, that you, Jesus, would come as a great, great Lord and a helpless baby. We ask, O oh God, that through your word and by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit among us, your church, that you would make that real for us in a new way this morning. Father, I ask that you would bind my lips and my tongue that no false word might pass from them. In fact, that you would just move me aside completely, and that it would be just your Holy Spirit who speaks straight to each and every heart. Fill us with your joy this morning, God. Joy to gather with the saints, to hear your word, and to have your Holy Spirit reveal to us the wonderful things contained within it. We praise your holy name. Amen. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And he shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Give me Jesus, the Prince of Peace. What does it mean that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I mean, we hear it every Christmas, Prince of Peace, but, but what does it really mean if we unpack it a little bit? Let's take Prince first. Jesus as a Prince. Prince means royalty. It means ruler. It means heir to a throne. It means Lord of our lives. Jesus, the Prince. And if he's the Prince of Peace, does that mean that he is prince over uh, the region of peace, like if you want to be under the lordship of Christ, you step into peace in your relationships with God, with others, with the creation, and then you're in the region of peace where Jesus is the prince? Or does it mean that, that he himself is just marked by peace, like 
He's the prince of peace. He's the most peaceful person in all the world. I, I grew up uh, with some kind of cheesy Christian uh, like media, television, radio drama, books. And there was this one show called Bible Man. And I will be stunned if anyone's heard of Bible Man. All right, a couple of Bible Man fans in the room. I, you what? Okay, you're right. A couple of people aware of Bible Man in the room. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it's not good. It's not good. But Bible Man, it was, he had like a lightsaber. It was like a combo of Star Wars and Superman. Um, you should check it out on YouTube if you want a good laugh. So in Bible Man, one of the supervillains in one of the very few episodes that they had money to make was <laughs> the Prince of Pride. The Prince of Pride, and he was called the Prince of Pride, not because he ruled over the region of pride, but because he was the most prideful person in all the world. His rule was marked by pride, by how proud he was. When Jesus is the Prince of Peace, does that mean that, that he is just the most peaceful, that his reign is marked by peace in all the land, or that he himself as a person is just peaceful. What does it mean that Jesus is the prince of peace? And, and what sort of peace is it anyways, right? Is it, is it peace from war, right? No fighting, the absence of fighting, or is it peace from distraction? Is it quiet and stillness and calm, the absence of chaos? What sort of peace is Jesus the prince of? Well, we're going to think theologically about this this morning, which means we're going to look at what the Bible has to say about Jesus as Prince of Peace, because frankly, it matters very little what we think it means by Jesus is the Prince of Peace, and it matters very much what the biblical authors intended to say. So, let's look at the text. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 Paul opens with this in this little passage of Scripture. For he himself, that's Jesus, is our peace. He himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, there are a couple things for us to unpack here in this verse. We have apparently two groups that are divided by a barrier that Jesus has destroyed. This barrier is called the dividing wall of hostility. So who are these two groups, and what is this wall, and how did it get there? Well, to answer these questions, we back up just a few verses to Ephesians 2, verse 11. And Ephesians 2, 11 says this, Therefore, remember that formerly... You who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. So Paul is writing to a group of Gentiles. Gentile means anyone who's not an Israelite. And he says, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth, your bloodline, your family uh, of origin is Gentile, not Israelite. And you are called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. So these are the two groups, right? We have the Gentiles and the Israelites. And the Gentiles are called uncircumcised by the Israelites. Now, why are they called that? Well, the, the rite of circumcision was the sign that the Lord had chosen to mark those who stepped into covenant relationship with him through the nation of Israel. But at this time in Israel, those who were uh, amongst the people of Israel would use this, this symbol of covenantal relationship as an insult. If you were an Israelite, to call someone uncircumcised was like hurling an insult at them. You uncircumcised people. Now imagine, if you just get creative with me for a second, that possibly... This insult was only an insult within the people of Israel. Like those people receiving it might not have been very insulted, you know. 
Like, uh, I, I'm a, I was homeschooled as a kid, and in some of my circles growing up, uh, maybe if we were to call someone a public schooler, it was like the low blow, like, you public schooler. You know, but outside of the very few of us who were homeschooled, um, it's like, oh, you got me. I'm a public schooler. Ouch, you know. Um, ouch, that one stings. Uh, not really an insult. Um, and I wonder if something similar is happening here. Like the people who get insulted by Israel, you uncircumcised people, they're like, zinger, nice one. Um, and you call yourselves the circumcision. That sounds like a cool club. I don't want to be a part of it. Um, maybe that's going on. But here, for the people of Israel, it was a very real thing. A very real thing. And we have these two groups. If we continue on in verse 12, we can get an answer about this dividing wall of hostility. Paul says again to the Gentiles, remember that at that time, that former time, you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. Now, if the insult of verse 11 fell comedically flat, this verse might get a little more real for the Gentile person. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. And here's the real pain. Without hope and without God in the world. And so this dividing wall of hostility, this barrier that separates the two groups, the Israelites and the Gentiles, is here in verse 12. These, these uh, covenants of the promise. Covenants of the promise. And the Gentiles are said that at one time they were foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Separate from Christ. Separate from God. Divided by this wall of hostility. And we know that the covenants of the promise came from God. And we know that they became a dividing wall of hostility. And something about that doesn't feel right. So let's dig a little deeper. What are these covenants of the promise? Well, in the Old Testament, there are three covenants. The first is known as the Abrahamic covenant. You'll find the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 12. And in Genesis chapter 12... God, Yahweh, appears to Abram and makes him a promise. He says, Abram, I will bless you. You will be a blessing. In fact, you will be such a blessing that through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. This is the Abrahamic covenant that God chose one man to produce one family through which all nations of the earth will be blessed. The second covenant of the Old Testament is known as the Mosaic Covenant or the Sinai Covenant. And we can learn about the Mosaic Covenant in Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19, 5 and 6. At this point in history, Israel, uh, well, Abram's family has turned into a great nation, just as God promised. The people of Israel. And they were slaves in Egypt for four generations, uh, they were led out by God's chosen servant Moses out of Egypt, across the Red Sea, into the wilderness. And they come to this mountain. This mountain is Mount Sinai. And at Mount Sinai, God again appears. And in chapter 19, verse 5, the Lord says this. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words, Moses, that you are to speak to the Israelites. And so this Mosaic covenant, it's very similar to the Abrahamic covenant, but the Lord takes it a step further. With Abraham, he said, "You, I will bless you and you will be a blessing to everyone. And here in the Mosaic Covenant, the Lord adds a qualifier. He says, if 
you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Now, what does it mean to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation? Well, in Israelite culture, in the Israelite community, what a priest would do is they would minister for, to the souls of the people. And they would intercede on behalf of the people to God. And so they would care for their souls. It's probably the closest thing that um, the Israelite community had to, like a pastor. That they would shepherd the people, that they would care for them, that they would help them in their sin, in their need. And they'd shepherd them into right relationship with God. And God says, if you keep my covenants, you will be a kingdom of priests. All of you will shepherd all the rest of the world into right relationship with me. But this covenant, keeping this covenant, was this covenant of Moses that God handed down. It was all these laws that the people of Israel had to follow in order to be restored in right relationship with God. The third covenant um, that you'll hear about in the Old Testament is the Davidic covenant. And God takes the Abrahamic covenant that was expounded through the Mosaic covenant and singles back in on one person yet again. And on David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, the Lord says this to David. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. And so we have these three covenants that are referenced here in Ephesians chapter 2 by this blanket statement, the covenants. The, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, and the Davidic covenant. And the point of these covenants is that God has chosen one family, and then in David, one line of royalty, through whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. Blessed to be a blessing. What Paul doesn't explicitly say in Ephesians chapter 2, but what we can imply from the implications of this text, is that Israel is failing in fulfilling this purpose of these covenants to bless all nations of the earth. Verse 11 said, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised, remember that's an insult by those who call themselves the circumcision, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship, cut off by a dividing wall of hostility, foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. And though God's purpose in the covenants was to bring all the world to himself, rather than live into this honor, this blessing, this commission. The people of Israel held the seal of the covenant above everyone else like an insult. They wanted the blessing without being a blessing. They wanted just the first part. And they hurled circumcision at all Gentiles to degrade, to beat down, and to cut off, you uncircumcised people. And so at this point in history, right before the very first Christmas, when Jesus was born as a baby in a manger, Israel is living outside of the covenant. And because Israel is living outside of the covenant, all peoples of the earth, are living outside of the covenant. Neither group has peace with God, and therefore neither group has peace with each other. In steps the Prince of Peace. Uh, the past few years of my life, I have learned a lot about contagion. Anybody else learned about contagion? I learned about contagion a couple years ago, March 2020, global pandemic smacks the United States 
uh, in the woodlands specifically, and uh, I did something that I felt was very smart at the time. I declared immunity. <laughs> I declared it. Uh, before the vaccine was, I declared immunity. And unfortunately for me, in my brashness, uh, this was reinforced very early on. Uh, just a few weeks into the pandemic, I committed the cardinal sin, I did the worst, and I accidentally switched drinks with someone else, unknowingly. I drank that drink, figured out that I had switched drinks with somebody, thought, I'll probably be fine. Um, they're not sick. And the next day, that person with whom I had switched tested positive. Um, guess what? The vid didn't want none of this, right? I did not get COVID. And, and so this told me in my heart, <laughs> you did it. You did it. You declared immunity and you are immune. And this declaration carried me forward for about a year and a half uh, until Thanksgiving of 2021. Uh, and Thanksgiving of 2021, I got so sick. Uh, I had a fever around 104 for like three days. I was having fever dreams. I was like seeing demons in the corner of the room. And I was alone in one bedroom, like a 11 by 8, for about six days. Uh, I got so sick of watching football that I can hardly just imagine how I could ever be in that spot. But I was there, sick of watching football, sick of being alone, and just miserable. And here's something I noticed about contagion through that process. Breathing the same air as somebody else can only spread bad things. Right? There's no good contagion. There's only bad contagion. In the body, in the flesh, the only thing that spreads in contagion are bad things, things that you don't want, right? You're never going to spend enough time breathing the same air as someone who has a six-pack and then catch their six-pack, right? <laughs> as much as you want it to happen, it just won't work. But when you combine the body and the mind something truly amazing can happen. When you combine the body and the mind and you spend enough time breathing the same air as someone with a six-pack, you might, through spending enough time with them, begin to catch something. You might begin to catch their motivation, their drive, their habits. When you breathe the same air through enough of their schedule you might begin to do the things that they do, lift the things that they lift, eat the things that they eat, and most importantly, not eat the things that they don't eat. And when you combine the body and the mind through contagion, something very powerful can happen. This past year, um, just to be vulnerable with you guys for a minute, has been a really, really tough year to be a pastor. It's been a really, really tough year to be a pastor. Poor Kelsey. Um, there would be a lot of days where I'd come home from work experiencing all the negative emotions, right? Sadness and loss, anger and frustration, Anxiety and fear, doubt. And I would bring that home like a sickness. And as I would breathe the same air as Kelsey, something truly amazing would happen. I would catch her peace. I would catch her peace. When I breathe the same air, body, mind, and spirit, 
It was like a miracle would happen. I would just get home, spew this negativity, all these negative emotions, and, and like the Holy Spirit would come over Kelsey, and she would transform into this like just peaceful, calm, sound-thinking human being. Immune to my toxicity. And I would catch her peace. And breathing the same air, sharing my feelings, being listened to, and listening to her, I would catch her peace. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 uh, is a messianic prophecy. It was written around 700 years before Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And the voice of God the Father is speaking through the lips of Isaiah to Jesus the Messiah. Verse 5. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. The Lord is listing his qualifications and saying, this is why you should listen to what I'm about to say. Verse 6. I, the Lord, have called you, the Messiah, in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a what? Excuse me? Covenant. I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the who? The Gentiles. To open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See, the former things have taken place, and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. The Father sent Jesus the Son as a covenant. And when the people of Israel had misused and missed the mark of the Davidic, the Abrahamic, and the Mosaic covenants, the Father said, I will keep my word. I will send to you a new covenant. Jesus, the Messiah, the Prince of Peace. Friends, if you feel lonely, if you feel like you sit in darkness, if you are a captive, if you're a captive to your sin, to that habitual sin that you go back to over and over again, if you're a captive to that little voice that says, say this, do this, watch this, drink this, eat this, Jesus is sent as a Messiah, a new covenant through which you will be delivered. The purpose of this new covenant is in Ephesians 2, verse 15. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace. And in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Church, if you feel far away, if you are in isolation, if you need peace, if the heart is crying out, give me peace, give me Jesus, he's here for you. He's here, draw near to him, breathe his air. I mean, actually breathe his air. Do you know that verse 18 says that 
For through Jesus, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you. If you want to be in the presence of Jesus, you just close your eyes and open up your heart to the possibility that the Spirit of God, the actual Spirit of the living God, is in you closer than the air you breathe right now. Come and listen to him preach peace to you. Come and listen to him whisper love to you. Yes, it's reading your Bible. Yes, it's prayer. It's more than that. It's not just checking things off a list. It's believing that the Holy Spirit of God is with you in reality. I mean, sometimes when I feel the presence of the Lord, I feel it in my heart, in my mind, but I can feel it in my body. The Lord is with you, really. And if you don't know how to meet with the Lord, man, we'd love to walk with you through that. We'd love to be disciples of Jesus Christ alongside of you. Just reach out. There's so many people that would love to walk with you through that. But we know from the rest of the New Testament that this covenant that was once given to Israel, the two made one by Jesus putting to death the dividing wall of hostility in his body through his death on the cross. We have now been given this job, this charge. And so this Christmas, as our hearts cry out for the Prince of Peace, just believe. That he's there. And when you feel his presence. Go into the world. And through you. All nations of the earth will be blessed. Bring the prince of peace. To the community around you. Let's pray. Father God. Thank you that when we turned away and our love failed, when we walked away from the covenants, that you kept your promise. God, you have every right to just discard the human race and start over or just stay with the Son and the Spirit and just not even deal with us. But you are so faithful. And when we couldn't fulfill the covenant, you sent the one who couldn't fail. And so help us. Help us to breathe the air of the Holy Spirit. Help us to sit at the feet of the Prince of Peace. That through him, we might have peace with you and peace with the world around us. Father, we love you and we trust you. And we thank you. And as we enter into this time of offering, God, we pray that you would bless both the gifts and the givers alike. That the gifts that are given would be multiplied by your power to bear fruit in this community, kingdom fruit, fruit that will last. And that those who give would be blessed by the freedom that comes from giving things away. We love you so much. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Prince of Peace. Amen. The ushers come forward for this morning's offer. Earth and shadow, restlessly hold, labor's waiting, silent hope, for the promise, and long still. Yeah.
special treat for you this morning. Most of you know that we have a partner in this community, Little Oaks, uh, and they are a preschool in our facility, and we partner with them. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, or maybe a week ago now, I got the privilege of uh, joining them for their Christmas program, and when I heard the sweet voices sing, I knew you all needed to be blessed in the same way that I was blessed. And so, uh, won't you join me in welcoming Robin, the director of Little Oaks, and all these wonderful kiddos. Take a bow. You deserve it. Thank you guys so much for coming to sing for us. Uh, Church, will you stand at this time and receive this benediction?
Lord, as we go forth from this place, we ask that you would give us your peace. That as we enter into time with the Prince of Peace, that we would catch him. His very presence, his very spirit, his very being through your Holy Spirit. And then we ask, oh God, that you would send us forth as agents of peace in the world. In Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit and the will of the Father. Amen. Go in peace, brothers and sisters.